How many people in the room are a CEO or a CEO equivalent where you report to a board? Almost all of you. All right, it's an easy game. Choice A, choice B. You just got to pick one. Choice A, you get to give a million dollars of value to your business this year, bottom line, guaranteed. One million dollars, bottom line, guaranteed. That's choice A. Choice B, you can give a billion dollars of value to your business, bottom line, this year, but it's not guaranteed. It's one chance in a hundred. Billion dollars, one chance in a hundred, that's choice B. Million dollars this year, that's choice A, 100%. Who's taking choice A? Who's taking choice B? Woo, y'all passed the math test. Everyone does except for this one group of science journalists. For some reason, I don't understand, like 80% of them raised their hand for choice A. I'm not sure what that says about science journalists. But now I have the really bad news for you. I do this all the time with CXOs, the people who report to you. And that's not the end of the game. The end of the game is where I say, everyone's got their hands up because they all just said choice B. And I say, okay, now leave your hand up if you believe even a tiny bit, slightly kind of, that your CEO seriously would support you choosing choice B. They all showed up to get a one hour lecture for me in innovation. And every hand in the room goes Bzzz. They don't need a lecture in innovation. They need a new manager. But that's tough because it's your people. You think it's not your people, but it is your people. Because I do this over and over again, and it's not like 50-50, there's like good companies. Every single CXO crowd, all the hands go down. And so I know you don't want to believe it, but your people, when you're not in the room, their hands will go down. This is what obsesses me. There's what we tell people we want them to do. The lip service of our companies. And then there's what they actually do. And those two things are not the same. That's what wakes me up in the middle of the night every night. That's what I'm thinking about. I think of myself as a culture engineer and I think my entire job is to make these two pointers kind of point in the same direction. So I want to tell you a little bit about X and about what we mean by a moonshot so that you have some context, but then I'm going to spend more of the time and I'm happy during Q&A to try to work with you on what the difference is between these two things. Because I can tell you mantras like 10x thinking and you'll go back to your people and you'll say 10x thinking and it's not going to make any difference because they're like, okay boss, and then they're going to go off and do the 10% stuff anyway because they don't really believe you want it. The, all of what's hard about this is this. It's getting them to actually do the things that you say that they should do. Not saying the right things. You don't need me on stage to tell you about moonshots, blah, blah, blah. You could just pick up a book and it'll basically say the right stuff. So what do we mean by a moonshot? What we mean by a moonshot is it has three basic elements. There has to be a huge problem with the world. There has to be a radical proposed solution, some science fiction sounding product or service that however unlikely to make, if you could make it, would actually solve that huge problem. And then there has to be some underlying breakthrough technology that makes it not completely crazy that you could make that science fiction sounding product or service. And each of these three things has a purpose. The purposes of the first circle, the top circle, is to prevent people from being academic. You don't want them just making a frictionless surface because they think frictionless surfaces are cool. <laughs> yeah, apparently you know some of those people. <laughs> the second circle, the radical solution, is to prevent people from thinking, well, my boss has got a lot of money. We'll just outspend everybody else. 
You do not want your people having their basic plan being that they're going to use more of your money than anyone else is willing to spend solving the problem. That is not a recipe for success. You want their plan to be, I can be braver, I can be weirder, I can be more creative than everybody else. That's what you want their plan to be because that doesn't cost any money. It doesn't even cost smarts. That's why we ask for a radical solution. And then, you know, I suppose they're in a government, maybe you wouldn't ask for breakthrough technology, but you want to make sure that your people are bringing to the table some reality check and some kind of like, hey, we're pretty good at this. It's not crazy to imagine we could make progress in this area. Most organizations kind of work like this. You start with a bunch of ideas and you get down to a small number of ideas. But this is like a dirty and uncomfortable secret, and mostly we don't talk about this. There are a few nerdy companies that have some sort of complicated waterfall talk that explains how they get from one of these stages to the other, but mostly people don't talk about it, and they don't talk about it because, wow, those are a lot of dots that go away. And that feels like they're people who are losing their jobs, who don't know what to do the next day. That's where all the fear comes from. So number one, be honest. If you're going to take moonshots, most of my ideas are terrible. Most of your ideas are terrible. That's okay. Let's just put all of our ideas on the table and start weeding through them. Let's know up front that 99% of our ideas are not going to make it. So if you are one of those people that's just got to make a flying car, Bless you, go make flying cars, but don't do it at X. Not because there's something wrong with flying cars, but you can't have an idée fixe about anything that you're working on. Because we're going to be intellectually honest about what we work on. We're going to put all the ideas on the table, and then we're just going to start finding reasons to take the ideas off the table and throw them in the trash as fast and efficiently as we can, and we're not going to have fear. We're going to do this dispassionately. I still haven't told you anything about how we're getting there, but I'm explaining to you why it's so critical that we solve this problem, why we build in people the feeling that it's okay, that it's natural. So now I'm going to tell you some of the things that we do. Feel free to steal them if you want. But it's not important that you do these things. What matters is that you do something, probably that you do a lot of some things. Your children do not listen to what you say. Your children are really interested in what you do. I know a lot of parents who tell their kids no screen time after four in the afternoon, and then they go back to their computers. Type, 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 type. That's BS. And your kids know it's BS. People in your organizations are exactly the same way. So here's an example of putting training wheels on the problem. One of the things I like to try to get teams to do is what I think of as a pre-mortem. How are we going to look at our failure before we even did the thing? Because maybe then we could avoid some of those. This is a moment of deep dispassion at a moment where things haven't even gone wrong yet. You are not in the mood to say, because nothing gone, has gone wrong yet, oh yeah, my thing's going to break, my thing's going to fail. How do you do that? So here's an example. Launch fever is that feeling, we're close enough, it's working well enough, go, go, go. So I sat down a team about two months before launch. It was actually the wing team as it, as it happens this was several years ago. Everyone had a piece of paper and a pen in front of them. And I said, it's three months from now. Our launch was an abysmal failure. And you know why it was. You know why it was. You have two minutes right now to write down why our launch was a failure two months from now. And we're walking around the halls and we can't even look each other in the eyes. That's how bad it is. We feel physically sick when we look at each other. This is a test. You have two minutes, go. And that triggers in everybody this intellectual response, not an emotional response, the test taking I want to please the teacher response. And they all start furiously scribbling why they're going to fail in two months. It's just an example, but you pull out of them that dispassion. And it, has, it feels unnatural the first two or three hundred times you do it. But after a while, it becomes natural to everybody. I'll give you another example. I do this all the time with teams. So they, I'm sure you will resonate with this. The team brings you a list of the things they need to do. 
It's the importance list. It's the features they should build, whatever it is, right? I'm sure you guys have all seen that list in one form or another in your company. And you ask, how is that list ordered? And they say, well, the important stuff is at the top, idiot. And they're like, the stuff that's less important is at the bottom. Oh, OK. Humor me. Just take the things on your list, that 20 things on your list, just reorder them. I'm not asking you to come up with new things. Just reorder your list so that the thing at the top is the thing you believe, however stupid to work on, would teach us the most. And then the next, the thing after that that would teach us the next most, and so on down. Okay, Astro, fine. So they make the list. Look, I'm sorry, I don't pull rank very often. I'm just telling you, you must go do the first two things on that list at the top of your second list, the learning list. Okay, whatever. They go do it. I've done this like 20 times. Every single time, after they've done the top two things on the list, I say, go ahead, remake the list. Make your important list, which they do, and it is unrecognizably different from their first list of 10 or 20 things that they were gonna do. There's nothing in common. And then I say, that is why we don't do things in importance order. We do things in learning order. But that's the kind of training wheels that you have to give people if you actually want them to learn. Telling them moonshots, rah, 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 don't be afraid of failure, rah, 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 will have absolutely no effect on them. It will be like water off a duck's back. One of the mantras we used to have, which was water off the duck's back of my people for a, kind of a while, was uh, work on the hardest part of the problem first. See, that's one of those fail fast kind of things. Be brave, don't work on the easy stuff. It had no effect on them. I tried like 10 different ways to really connect with them about why it was so important to work on the hard part first. But you have to get it stuck in their brain in a way they can say it to someone else, in a way that it's portable, that it infects the organization, because that's what culture is, is people talking to each other, not you talking to them. So one day, I was joking. It was several years ago, I was a Wall Street Journal Live thing. And I was trying to describe this and I said, look, if you were trying to train a monkey to recite Shakespeare on top of a 10 foot platform, you could train the monkey first or you could build the pedestal first. It's tempting to build the pedestal first because then your peers come by and you're like, look, I built something. And they're like, hey, nice pedestal. And your boss comes by and he's like, hey, nice pedestal. Making progress, Astro. And you're feeling all good about yourself. You are totally wasting your team's money. You are totally wasting your boss's time when you make that pedestal. But it wasn't until I told the story that way that people actually started internalizing it. And even that kind of storytelling and internalizing isn't enough. When people started putting little monkeys, little monkey icons, next to the hard part of what they were working on in their slide decks, I would physically get up out of my chair and hug whoever was talking. If you don't give them like stupid amounts of positive reinforcement when they do the thing you want them to do, why would they keep doing it? They're really just mostly just trying to maximize positive reinforcement from you. But I don't think they're really getting from you that you seriously want moonshots. So if you want your group to take moonshots, you have to start by making it socially uncomfortable for people to suggest 10x, 10 10% thinking in your office. For everyone to go, oh, a little embarrassing. And you need to start with that same blase attitude anytime someone suggests, let's get our revenues up by 10% this year. Oh, you know, maybe this isn't really the place for you. I could help you find a good place. There are lots of places that would appreciate that kind of thinking. You want people to feel like their jobs are tied to the weirdness and the bravery and the creativity. So, why don't we talk a little bit and then I'll describe the game. Okay. Good. So I've got a, uh... so first of all, amazing, huh? That's, that's... I, um, 